doctor believe this crap? He's an AIDS denier, part of a misguided minority who believes that HIV doesn't cause AIDS and that AIDS itself doesn't exist. Two-thirds of the world's HIV-positive kids get infected during pregnancy or at birth from the mother. The rest acquire it during breastfeeding. Okay, so Susan could have passed the virus to Lisa either way. It's a shame. HIV-positive women in this country have a 98% chance of having a healthy baby if they take antiretrovirals during pregnancy and put the child on meds after birth. Which Susan probably didn't do because she thinks HIV is harmless. Yeah, she put Lisa's life in danger by breastfeeding her and by withholding medication when Lisa got sick. And since any reasonable person knows HIV causes AIDS, that's criminally negligent homicide. HIV attacks the life-saving T-cells that fight disease. The virus genetically mutates the host cell, turning it into an HIV factory, which makes more copies of the virus. Eventually, HIV kills T cells faster than the body can replenish them, destroying the immune system and causing AIDS. Dr. Warner, can you tell the jury how we know this? HIV has been isolated, photographed, cultured, and grown outside the human body. Its genetic structure is fully documented and it's killed more than 25 million people since 1981, including Lisa Ross. That clip, did that show did not go over well. I, I gave a presentation in Paris about two years ago uh, with the Aspen Institute. It did not go over well with the Gambian and um, South African contingent, but that was, the point, and then there are many people in the United States who don't believe that HIV causes AIDS as well, and it got people stirred up, and then when that happens, I'm really happy, because, yeah. because then they will go and have a conversation and talk about it, and hopefully, you know, do some more research. Well, um, this is a really important clip, and Hollywood Health and Society conducted an evaluation of the impact on viewers. And our research showed significant knowledge gains among viewers who had never been tested for HIV, an increased awareness of HIV deniers among females, and an increase in global health priorities among viewers. So we use these findings to show that powerful storytelling like Retro, this was the clip called Retro, can impact viewers' knowledge and attitudes about global health. So let's transition, and now it's time to hear from the extraordinary Mariska Hargitay. And she'll start by showing us two clips of her compelling work on SVU. And she will also talk about how her role on this series inspired her pioneering efforts to address the devastating reality of sexual violence and abuse and to help survivors to heal. So Mariska, the floor is yours. Oh, thank you. Well, thank you, Sandra. And uh, thank you, everyone. I, I'm, I'm so honored to be here. And the people tonight have come up to me and said, thank you for your work. And I just want to reflect that back to you and say thank you for your work. Um, when I started on Law and Order Special Victims Unit 11 years ago, sexual violence had never played any significant role in my life, and certainly not on a daily basis, and uh, certainly not the kinds of issues that the show addresses. And then there I was, immersed every day, in some of the worst that people can do to each other. But it wasn't just the scripts and uh, that pressed the tragedy and the per pervasiveness of these acts into my consciousness. It was actually the letters that I was getting. Um, I'd appeared in you know, lots of other projects uh, before SVU, and I had gotten letters like, hi, my name is Amy. I'm 16 years old, and I love your show. Can you send me a photo? Um, <laughs> Now I was getting, hi, my name is Amy, I'm 16 years old, and my father has been raping me since I was 12, and I've never told anyone. So I, uh, I remember the breath sort of leaving my body as the first uh, letter came, and I've gotten thousands of letters like that since. So, you know, the show operates in the world of fiction, and I'm fortunate that I can close my dressing room door and go home at the end of the day to comfort and safety. But the show's fiction are based in facts. And the facts are simply horrific. 
Nearly one billion women, that's one in three women worldwide, will be beaten, raped, and abused during her lifetime. Yet, around the world, women suffer in silence, ashamed, and alone. So every two minutes, someone in the United States is sexually assaulted. Rape and sexual assault have the lowest reporting, arrest, and prosecution rates of all violent crimes in the United States. Neil, who you've heard from, our brilliant Neil, and our brilliant team of writers have taken some of the darkest crime and the worst human suffering imaginable and brought them out of the shadows and placed them into the sharp light of primetime television and allowed us, as actors, to be the voice for victims. Please watch this portrayal of, an ex of the experience of a courageous survivor in the aftermath of her assault. How did he get you? After I ran out of the apartment, I cried for like three blocks, and I noticed a man was walking next to me. He said I was too pretty to be crying. Got to his van, he said he had something that would make me feel better. He went into the van? No. He put a handkerchief over my mouth with some kind of chemical on it. That's all I remember before I woke up. Where was that? On a concrete floor. It was pitch black. I didn't have any clothes on. I stood up and felt along the walls, screaming for help. I got to a metal door and I started pounding on it. There was a mattress. I laid down on it and cried. I must have fallen asleep. I woke up when he came in. He put a combination lock on the inside of the door. He got on top of me. I kicked and screamed and hit. He said he'd come back when I was ready to be sweet. He said if I couldn't be nice, he'd let me starve to death. I thought I made it about a week without eating. He said it was only two days. Every year, more than 200,000 courageous individuals report their rape to the police in the United States. Almost all are asked to have a rape kit collected. The process that you just saw in the clip can take four to six hours. We've learned that the healing process for survivors begins and is often sustained in the response of the communities around them. The medical community is often the first responder in the rape crimes and getting that response right is critical for the survivors and our society. So that is why I'm so proud to be working in partnership with the government and sexual assault advocates to educate medical professionals to ensure that they are ready and prepared and trained before the victim comes to the door and not reading out loud the rape kit instructions uh, the first time, for the first time as the victim is sitting on the table, which is an unfortunate reality that we are still hearing about today when survivors reach out to us. So our hope is that in educating the medical profession about sensitive and effective rape kit collection will lessen the trauma that the victim suffers, bring perpetrators of sexual violence to justice, and that journey toward healing can begin. The potential benefits of testing of the DNA evidence in the rape kits are enormous. It can identify an unknown perpetrator, it can confirm the presence to a known assailant, corroborate the victim's account of rape, and exonerate innocent suspects. National studies have shown that cases in which rape kit was collected, tested, and found to contain DNA evidence are more likely to move forward in the criminal justice system. For example, when New York City began to test every book, rape, sorry, every rape kit, um, the arrest kit, the arrest, um, arrest rate for rape kits skyrocketed from 40% to 70% for reported cases. And conversely, untested rape kits typically represent a loss of justice for rape victims. And in the United States today, it is estimated that there are hundreds of thousands of untested rape kits sitting in police evidence storage facilities and crime labs across the country. So we're working in collaboration with the Department of Justice, Congress, law enforcement, advocates, and survivors to bring attention, funding, 
and new legislation to eliminate the backlog. So, so many of the fierce men and women who are fighting for justice of rape victims are in this room tonight, and for that I am so grateful. Um, in April of last year, uh, Nicholas Kristof wrote an editorial in the New York Times entitled, Is Rape Serious? Now, about the backlog of untested rape kits in police freezers around the country, he concluded the quote from Polly Poskin, an executive director at the Illinois Coalition Against Sexual Assault, quote, if you've got stacks of evidence, of physical evidence of a crime, and you're not doing everything you can with the evidence, then you must be making a decision that this isn't a very serious crime, end quote. So. You have my fierce commitment and ongoing support of Joyful Heart to continue to stand with all of you and do whatever it takes to bring justice and healing to survivors. Sexual violence is not only an epidemic in this country, as we all know. It knows no borders and touches every corner of the globe. When I was preparing to shoot the appropriately titled episode, Hell, that Neil just told you about, in fall of 2009, I read and watched films about the atrocity of being perpetrated in Congo, Uganda, and Sudan. I learned of gang rapes, internal mutilations, amputations, and rape as an instrument of war. I learned of women who had been raped so violently that they can no longer control their bowels. I learned of government, military, and social systems that not only fail to prosecute those committing these acts, but fail to condemn them, and worse still, harbor, protect, and sometimes include the perpetrators. I learned of hundreds of thousands of women imprisoned in silence of fear and shame. Let's take a look at a clip from a recent episode, one that I'm so proud of that just aired last week called Witness. <laughs> <laughs> 